Hey, Kids Cook Real Food. I am here with Dr. Sheila Kilbane back again. We did an amazing interview on inflammation previously, and she's back today. We are going to talk about the power of healing with food by cutting out some of our favorites and how to avoid the fallout from that that can happen at the dinner table with our families and our real children. So thank you for being back with us today, Dr. Kilbane. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, just to introduce our community to you, Dr. Sheila Kilbane is an integrative MD. She's dedicated to helping children really thrive in health by getting to those root causes of what's going on with them. She's known as the pediatrician who is a voice for children, an ear for parents, and a solution to other doctors. And although she's local to Charlotte, North Carolina, she has an online course, Healthy Kids, Happy Moms, that can help anyone do the detective work of what's going on with their kids and getting down to the root cause, you know, anyone across the nation. So we'll make sure we, you know, share links on how to find her anywhere we share this video. But today, we are really gonna talk about cutting some inflammatory favorites. So remind us really quickly, Dr. Kilbane, for anyone who didn't get to hear your last interview, by the way, go listen to it. Um, what What's going on with inflammation and our kids? Why is it affecting us negatively? Yeah, so we have shifted the foods that we're eating and we're eating a lot of packaged processed foods and those are very inflaming. And we've literally shifted the ratio of fats in our cell walls with what we're eating. And so in order to get that back in the balance so that we have more of an, you know, we call it an anti-inflammatory diet to where it supports our immune, immune system instead of inflaming our immune system, that is what's gonna allow us all to be healthier. And you can literally see inflammation these kids, and I can see these kids a mile away, and, and parents, they'll have dark circles under their eyes. They may be mouth breathing. These, these are the people who also mouth breathe and snore at night. They'll, you'll, they'll have bumps on the back of their arms or their cheeks. They may have reddish cheeks, red ears, eczema. It can mm -hmm. be constipation, abdominal pain, um, allergies, chronic runny nose. So those are those are such just some of the symptoms that you're going to see to know if you're inflamed. Yeah. So bottom line, these inflammatory foods are affecting everything from our guts to our brains to our skin, and and it can be a big problem. So we're going to talk about how cutting some you know kid favorites can help with that. Sorry, families. Uh, Dr. Kilbane usually advocates for her patients to cut dairy now. My family still drinks dairy. We get three and a half gallons of raw milk a week, and, and when we start getting low on cheese, we have little panic attacks. Uh, so I don't want to know the answer to this question, but should every human cut dairy? Or only? Well, just no. <laughs> what? So, <laughs> Do we all have to cut dairy? You still ate dairy, but you didn't tell me three gallons a week. So, but but the one thing, so I'm gonna I'm gonna throw you a few bones here. So the one thing is you said that you're drinking raw milk, which ironically is illegal in North Carolina. So our families can't get it. It's only and, partly legal here in Michigan. <laughs> okay, so it's if you're if you're a family who's healthy and everybody's having a daily easy bowel movement and there are no skin issues and there are no major emotional issues or behavior issues, then your systems probably tolerate dairy. And especially if you're of Scandinavian descent, though, I mean, those are the, the cultures that are the highest in their ability to process dairy. Okay. But also if you go to milk that is not pasteurized and, or homogenized, it's gonna be more of the, the milk the way that it came out of the cow. So if you pasteurize milk, that means you heat it up and that changes the configuration of the protein and makes it even more inflaming. And then we homogenize it. So that means we're gonna push the fat into the rest of the milk so that the cream doesn't rise to the top. You know, when they used to deliver milk in a bottle, the cream was on top. And so homogenization makes so that that doesn't happen. And the, it's the way that we process milk that makes it even more inflaming. Mm -hmm. So if you are a family that is completely healthy and you tolerate dairy, those are the kinds of dairies that I would recommend. You know, the, 
raw milk or you know lightly pasteurized milk but always doing the whole fat would be my preference because then you're going to drink less of it and your body's going to feel full and you're not going to you know have to drink a ton of it and you know older aged cheeses um yogurts that are i you know and ideally if you make your yogurt that would be amazing um if not, you want to get the non-sugar or lower sugar, not the ones that are sweetened. I mean, because you can get, you can run into about five teaspoons in a container of even the, you know, raw or, or not raw, but I'm sorry, organic yogurts that are flavored. You can have a tremendous amount of sugar in them. Mm -hmm. So we really want to look at this critically. But, you know, the question and the thing that we're talking about here today is if you do need to go off of it, you know, why are you going off of it? And it will be for all of those reasons that I just discussed. If your child or anybody in your family is having any one of those inflammatory symptoms that we in conventional medicine will put a diagnosis code on, and that can be either constipation, you know, keratosis pilaris, eczema, recurrent ear infections, recurrent sinus infections, allergies, asthma, um, headaches. Those are the things that we, it's always worth a trial because it, again, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. It's not an expensive thing to do. And you just pull it for three to four weeks and see if there are symptoms, you know, see if the symptoms improve. And we literally go through when I'm, you know, we're taking notes in the chart and we list how many bowel movements a day does the child have? How many, you know, how bad is their runny nose? How, how is their skin? Feel the skin before you do this so that mm -hmm. you can actually monitor and you have some concrete things to look for to know if you're seeing the improvements. And we have a lot of before and after pictures of kids because I always tell the moms, take, the, take those before pictures so that we know if we're making a difference. So That's it's, great. It's, and it's doable. You can absolutely yeah. Makes sense. So every family might not need to cut dairy, but if you've got anything going on, it's kind of the top contender for let's try something and see what works, huh? Yeah, and especially yeah. If, you, if your child is on a daily medication, whether it's a laxative like Miralax, an antacid medication, a reflux medication, a steroid, take them off of dairy and just see if you see an improvement. I can't tell you the hundreds of kids that we've thrown away medications because we've been able to decrease their, their systemic inflammation by changing their diet. And wow. the predominant thing is taking them off of dairy. Mm -hmm. That's so good to hear. I mean, that's so amazing to hear about real success stories. You know, so, I mean, the people for, for whom that works have some sort of sensitivity or dairy to aller or sensitivity or allergy to dairy. And, and no one can deny that all of those things are really rising in the last few decades. We hear a lot more allergies, a lot more sensitivities. How does this impact patients in your practice and kind of how you treat them? Do you do a lot of allergy testing because of that? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I always like to point out the different categories of, of food allergy versus sensitivity versus something like celiac disease. So a food allergy, the kind that you might have anaphylaxis to, that is mediated by a pro, an IgE protein. And those are the times I want you in a pediatric allergist's office. You need to be properly tested and educated, and you may need an EpiPen. So that's an entirely different category. And what we're talking about here are the, the sensitivities. And this can be, it's the, the inflammation is mediated through a different protein. And it can be an IgG protein, so it could be more of a delayed type hypersensitivity. And so it's not like where anaphylaxis is an immediate thing. This is more delayed, where your skin is inflamed, your nose is running, mm -hmm. your, you have post-nasal drip and a cough. And you can do testing for this. It's, it's not 100% accurate. So I typically don't do testing because most of the kids who have something going on, they also have an inflamed gut. And so if I did IgG food sensitivity testing in these children, a lot of foods would come up positive. And it's, it's what we wanna do is clean up the gut. And what I tell a family is no matter what an allergy test showed me right now, I would still recommend that we pull dairy. So one of the cardinal rules in medicine is 
test something to confirm your suspicion or if you're going to use the test. And if I'm going to, mm -hmm. I'm not going to use it if it's negative, then we're just going to make the changes and save the child a poke, you know, a blood draw, and we're just going to make the changes. And one of the things I always talk about is that I've seen so many kids who have had allergy testing from either their pediatrician or their allergist, and that IgE protein is negative. And so they keep eating dairy and they never do the trial off of it. So that's where you want to go ahead and do the trial off of it. And again, we're talking about dairy here. This does not apply to, to peanuts and anaphylactic type issues because those, you know, sometimes the kids, if they are sensitized to it, they have to eat. Like I have a child who has to eat nine peanuts every day in order because he used to be anaphylactic to it. And now he's got to, you know, that's his way so that he doesn't develop the anaphylaxis again. So it, there's, a, there's a big difference there. Okay, okay. That's interesting. So we're not, again, not talking a true allergy because that's IgE. So this is an IgG. And, and the sensitivity still can cause a whole lot of problems based on inflammation. So it's worth, it's worth that experiment, that three to four week test. Now, what other foods, if dairy doesn't work, are there other kind of trigger foods that parents should know about? Yes, and I wanted to say one more thing about that is if you're seeing the improvements over those three to four weeks, this means we need to stay off of it for mm -hmm. three months, six months, potentially lifetime and only getting small amounts of it. So it's not that you go three to four weeks and then you're done. That just tells us where we need to move forward. And that's where things like, you know, having the resources that Katie has, doing my online course, something where you'll need more ongoing support for that. And so if, if you go off of dairy and you're seeing some improvements but not fully, that's where I talk about the list. So there are 11 foods that cause 90% of our issues. And our issues mean inflammation. So mm -hmm. if you're having stomach pain, constipation, all of those things we've talked about. So it's dairy soy, wheat, eggs, corn, peanuts, tree nuts, fish, shellfish, sesame, and citrus. Mm. And so it does not mean that all of those are unhealthy. It doesn't mean you have to go off of all of those. It just means that if you're having issues and you've pulled dairy, you may consider going and pulling. And what you want to do is you want to keep the kids off of dairy and then you're going to pull the next food. And soy is typically the next one I talk about because anywhere from 20 to 40% of kids who are sensitive to dairy are also sensitive to soy. And I learned that the hard way in practice years ago where I would swap the kids out with dairy for soy and they would come back six weeks later with either loose stools or maybe their rash or their eczema would have gone away, but then it came back. Oh. So, um, so, so that's where we understanding food and inflammation is what helps you moms and dads are the, the sleuths that really start to figure this out when they get it. Yes. Yes. And it just, it takes a lot of that testing. Now you, that last one you mentioned, citrus is not one I'm real familiar with. Tell me a little bit more about that for moms. Yeah. So citrus is one we talk about in particular if the kids are getting what we call perioral dermatitis. So it's that rash that's around that mouth that can be such trouble to get rid of. And there are really three things that can trigger that. Citrus is one of them. It can also be cinnamon flavoring and it can be tartar control and toothpaste. So, but citrus of those can be much, a much bigger issue. Um, but the citrus can also be a trigger for eczema. And again, this is much, much lower down on, you know, being common than dairy or eggs or something like that. But there is a case that I, I, I've talked about from one of my partners of a little boy who had eczema. And, you know, my partner and the mom figured out that it was dairy and citric acid. And so they got his whole skin beautiful. He still had a little bit of eczema, I mean, asthma. So he was doing palmocort nebulizers, or budesonide is the generic name for it. And he had a persistent perioral rash. 
And so the mom, knowing that she needed to pay attention to things, opened up the packing slip to the budesonide and read that it had citric acid. So they stopped the budesonide and they switched him to a pump inhaler. I think they went to Cuba or full event or something. And so they're still controlling his asthma, which needed, you know, it did need a prescription medication for, but his, his perioral dermatitis went away. And citric acid is in a lot of processed foods as, is it a preservative, I think? It's a preservative. It's in a lot of supplements, a lot of packaged foods. And there are certain kids where sometimes all you need to do is look at oranges, grapefruit, lemon, oh, okay. you know, the biggies. But then there are some that are really sensitive that you have to go even to everything to look at everything. But it doesn't, with these foods, the beauty is that it doesn't always mean forever. It typically means we have to pull them. We've got to decrease the body's inflammation, get the gut healed, you know, get good healthy bacteria mm -hmm. in their gut. And then we can usually add it back in. If not as much as you were doing before, they can at least do it at times and not have the huge flare up that they used to have. Good to know. That's good to know. A little, little message of hope. But you know, if you're having orange juice every day and especially that oral kind of mouthy area rash, you do, I do see kids with that, especially little, wee little kids. And, and a lot of times you think it's from them licking or yeah. this or that. And it might be, but yeah. it's, it's something yeah. to think about that the citrus could be inflaming that area. Um, yeah. Now, when we talk about cutting foods or all this experimentation and detective work, even just cutting dairy, technically that's an elimination diet. Now, there are a lot of gut healing diets that adults tend to go on. We see out there Whole30, Paleo, Keto, GAPS, all that stuff. Do you ever advocate a diet for kids? So we typically, you know, I rarely use the word diet in, you know, and in, in what we mean by it is really just the nutrition but mm -hmm. what we do is I, I call it a strategic elimination. And we do we take those list of foods, like when families come and see me, they get a binder and they get that list of foods. And so we systematically go through and we start with dairy. And we pull dairy for three to four weeks. If we're starting to see improvements, then we keep the dairy out and then we move on to the next food. And it's mm -hmm. typically, you know, we're usually – Soy and dairy, we will we will sometimes do somewhat together, but then usually in my practice, the next food is going to be gluten that we pull. Mm -hmm. um, but you have to, because there's a cumulative effect, if you pull dairy and don't see a difference and then put dairy back in and then pull gluten, you may not see as profound an improvement as you would have if you took both of them out. And so that's why when you pull one, you want you all that work to pull it. You want to keep it out and then pull the next one so that we can really see. And then if you think, you know what, I really don't think dairy made the difference, then you put the dairy back in while you still have the gluten out, and then you see if the symptoms go back. And I'm, okay. I'm just going to give you one situation. I had a little boy that came to see me with ticks. And terrible ticks. He had so bad that he pulled the muscle in his neck. Oh and so we pulled dairy. Didn't make a difference. And that was the time that I, I didn't know as much as I do now. And we put the dairy back in, but then we pulled gluten. And for him, 80% of his ticks went away. So that was a case where he really didn't need to be off of dairy. And the gluten made a huge difference. And he's um, he was one of those also big dark circles and when you look at his before and after picture it's, it's significant how impressive and this this it's just such practical information take before and after pictures make a list of symptoms and their severity you know once you cut one thing keep that out and cut another it's we really do have to be detectives as moms and it's it's kind of hard and taxing uh, this feels overwhelming still again dr kilbane's course healthy kids happy moms walks you through all those steps with a little hand holding <laughs> And the other thing, too, is if you have a generally healthy kid, this isn't, you know, you won't have to go there. It's people, this feels a lot less hard than staying up in the middle of the night with a child who's itching or screaming. You know what I mean? Is mm -hmm. Moms do hard things. Parents do hard things. And this, this is, if you know, if this is going to help them to sleep better at night and help you stay off of Dr. Google, that's when I find, those are when it's easy to make these more difficult changes. 
Yeah, yeah, you're totally motivated when your child's really in pain and the whole family's sleep is disrupted. Um, and then, now what about the moms who are in that lovely situation where they have a baby or a toddler or a young child and they don't have any problems yet? How important is it to start off right with a clean that's, diet? That's my favorite. And so that's where we just start. And this is, it's sort of heresy, but I don't recommend families go on dairy when the kids turn a year of age. And that, and I have to put this out there that that goes against what the American Academy of Pediatric recommends. So they recommend, which I'm board certified, and they recommend that you go, you know, that the kids go on whole milk at a year of age. Mm -hmm. But I've just seen so many problems that I just recommend that the families go on water. And it doesn't mean you have to be completely off of dairy, but if you're going to do it, do the smart dairy. Do, you know, some good yogurt, ideally homemade, you know, do the hard cheeses and then give the kids, we want them to be eating good fats and good healthy protein. So we, because it's super important, one of the reasons is we do whole milk is for that good fat and you can do things like butter butter is going to also be a better choice of dairy because it has less casein which is the protein that is so inflaming so butter is going to be great a good organic grass-fed butter and um coconut oil which is it's a fat is called the medium chain triglyceride mm -hmm. and salmon cold water fish like wild caught sockeye salmon those are going to be really great choices um okay. chia seed black seed, hemp seed. Yep, makes sense. Now what about, I mean, I, I can just hear the grandmas now, oh, how are they gonna get their calcium? They're all gonna break their bones. What do we What do we say to the grandmas? Yes, yes, so there is so much that goes into a healthy bone other than calcium. And the dairy and calcium is about like a, a cup of calcium, about 35% of that calcium is absorbable. And if you take a cup of bok choy, about 54, 55% of that calcium is absorbable. So there are a lot of ways to get calcium and it doesn't have to be through dairy. So it's, it, we, we have to look at that. And the other components that go into healthy bones are weight bearing activity, which if you have a child who's climbing on a jungle gym, who's running and playing, they're getting weight bearing activity and then adequate levels of vitamin D. So vitamin D is what helps us to absorb calcium out of our gut. And if we're, we really want to be keeping that good vitamin D. And I do advocate supplementing vitamin D in the wintertime only. When it's sunlight, we want to be getting vitamin D naturally through the skin, you know, without burning. Um, and you don't get it through sunscreen, so you have to be careful with that. You just have to give the kids about 15 to 30 minutes outside without sunscreen, but without burning. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are all, many, all of the other minerals that are involved with bone health. So, you know, there's zinc, there's copper, there's all, all, the, all the different minerals that we don't need a whole lot of. We just need in trace amounts. And so those are things like that's where bone broth can be a really great healthy part because you're going to get those minerals from that bone marrow that you know those bones that were boiling okay um, and the other way if you can get clean seafood oysters clams mussels those have a lot of minerals in them okay and it's calcium or the other minerals it's some of the other minerals so because okay. I, I i'd like to get people to think about healthy bones versus calcium uh. does that because sure. we've gotten hyper focused on calcium, what we really need to think about are healthy minerals and healthy bones. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I think the milk industry has been huge in perpetuating that that single focused sort of myth that calcium is the only thing we need for healthy bones, exactly. right? So we've got to shed those commercials with the milk mustache and realize that the primary goal is the bones, and there are lots and lots of components two healthy bones. Oh my goodness, such good stuff. Let's end with something really, really practical. And again, I know some parents are just like, their hair is raising an end, like, oh, no cheese, no yogurt. I don't know if I can do this. What? Let's think about what we can eat. What are some foods that kids would really love that are either a good substitute for the dairy products or, or just, again, something positive that we can say, oh, at least we can do more of yeah. this that our kids will love. 
So the one way that I love, so cereal becomes a big challenge if you're saying yeah. take away the milk. Yeah. And, you know, the, the, my favorite solution is let's replace the cereal with a green smoothie and maybe some eggs in the morning or even a piece of organic sausage or organic bacon mm -hmm. or a, a leftover burger from the night before. Mm -hmm. Or you use one of the other kinds of milks. You use coconut milk or hemp milk or almond milk. And that is a really easy swap out. And you just want to be careful. You want to read ingredient lists and mm -hmm. you don't, you know, we don't want to swap out like chocolate almond milk or cow's milk because the sugar that's in the chocolate milk is going to just, that's going to be that more inflaming than what the dairy was going to be. So you just want to be careful with that. And then there are some great cheeses now. I mean, I, cause I've been dairy free for a while and the only option used to be a really terrible vegan cheese. And what I found though, I recently I've been buying, I've tried the, the cheeses that are, dairy free and soy free and it I just have some in my refrigerator that are amazing I got a smoked gouda I got an American um, I also a lot of my patients tolerate um, goat cheese or sheep cheese even mm. the ones that don't tolerate cow's milk but I don't recommend you do those until you've done your full trial to see where mm. the kids are get rid of their symptoms and then you can add the other species cows or sorry the other species cheeses in sure. to see if you tolerate them but those are options for cheeses and then with ice cream not a moo is a new ice cream that i just recently tried it is to die for oh my gosh coconut milk? and again What's it's gonna it's coconut milk ah. and it's it's gonna be sugar so we're not getting away from the sugar but mm -hmm. um when you just when you need that creaminess and that's the thing is dairy is so yummy and gooey mm -hmm. but i promise you if i can do it anybody can do it yes and you know for creamy and frozen there are so many good kind of coconut oil based fudgy recipes with coconut oil and honey and stuff that you could freeze in little balls and just kind of suck yes. on it and make a big mess and and satiate that need for for the creamy yummy stuff yeah. Oh my goodness. So it's so it's doable if your child has, you know, these symptoms, this constipation, the eyes, the skin rashes, and even even moodiness, recurrent ear infections, so many things can be connected. Yeah. It's maybe worth, you know, trying an elimination diet and cutting the dairy, but do it in a smart way. Be a detective, write things down, take pictures, um, and your kids' health is very, very worth it. Thank you so much, Dr. Kilbane, for joining us again. You are welcome. Thanks for having me and thanks for what you're doing. Great. And of course, we teach kids to cook at Kids Cook Real Foods. So if you need more ideas on getting your kids in the kitchen and, and eating real whole foods, fruits and vegetables and all those greens and getting all those minerals, we will help you out. And as always, come back next week for more tips on raising healthy kids and just being that great parent that we know you want to be.